Hello, everyone. My name is Tom, and uh, I will today be talking to you about Chernobyl, uh, as you hopefully will probably know. And I'll be talking to you about the what's and the why's and the how's of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at whether or not Chernobyl was actually the real reason why the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Now, if I could ask uh, if everyone has any questions uh, throughout, then I will be answering them all at the end, just so that I want to make sure that I fit everything in, because I don't want this to overrun uh, for your sake and for mine. Um, so I think, oh, one more person. I think that's everything, so I will get started. Can everyone see that? I hope so, okay, good, All right. So uh, I want to start this presentation off with a prophecy of all things. You probably didn't expect that, but I'll just read this prophecy to you now. There fell a great star from heaven, burning as if it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, this is a place from the Bible, it's from the book of Revelations, and it is a verse that a lot of scholars have actually found to be a little bit spooky, for, for lack of a better word. You see, what if I told you that the Ukrainian translation for Wormwood, Ukraine being the country where the reactor is located, is Chernobyl. And when you bear in mind that nuclear reactors are essentially man-made stars, the processes that go on inside stars and nuclear reactors are very, very similar. And bearing in mind that uh, Chernobyl disaster heavily contaminated Ukraine's three largest rivers, the Urs, the Dnieper, and the Pripyat, this prophecy, if you read through it again, uh, is a little bit eerie, don't you think? Or at least I thought so. Uh, so eerie, in fact, that it convinced the US president at the time of the disaster, Ronald Reagan, that Chernobyl was uh, indeed prophesied by the Bible. Now, whether you believe in the, the biblical foreshadowing of Chernobyl or not, Mikhail Gorbachev, who is the, the last general secretary of the Soviet Union, certainly seems to believe uh, about its divine significance, as he said once in an interview with the Financial Times, that Chernobyl was perhaps the true cause for the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, this quote, and it is that quote that sparked my intrigue into the topic of Chernobyl, uh, and that's why I did it for my APQ projects, which is how I gathered all of this information. But uh, today, that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be trying to break down uh, over the next half an hour, 40 minutes or so, whether or not this was the case. Uh, and in the picture there, you can see Mikhail Gorbachev himself in the middle, on his one and only visit to the Chernobyl reactor in 1989, three years after the disaster took place. So that is a claim from Gorbachev, that is a very bold claim, uh, and it logically begs the question, was it really? Um, and that was the very essence of, of my PQ project. And so I've, I've striven to try and answer this question, was Chernobyl, the, or the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, really the true cause for the collapse of the Soviet Union? Um, and I hope everyone here will be able to make up their own judgment by the end of my presentation uh, as to whether they think there is an element of truth to what Gorbachev uh, was saying here. So with that in mind, where to begin? Well, it's a very, very loaded question, but we've got to start somewhere. So what was the USSR? I just very briefly want to clear up for everyone in the call what the USSR actually was so that we know uh, what we're even looking at here. So very, very briefly, the, the USSR or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was a collection of 15 countries, most famously Russia, but also countries like Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and it was a communist state that was a global superpower rivaled only by the USA through much of the 20th century. And it was that conflict, that, that rivalry between the USA and USSR that was called the Cold War, uh, which lasted from about 1947 all the way up until the collapse in 1991. Uh, and some would even argue that it continues to this day, but that is a debate for another day. Um, I know that's a, a very extremely short summary of what the Soviet Union was, but and I know to many of you will probably already know this and a lot more, but I, for those of you who don't, it's, it's obviously crucial that we understand roughly what the Soviet Union was before we 
start asking why it collapsed on Christmas Day 1991. And that leads us on very nicely to the next question we need to answer, uh, which is, what was Chernobyl? So we've, we've got our quote, Chernobyl was perhaps the true cause for the collapse of the Soviet Union. We now know what the Soviet Union was, uh, but of course, to try and answer that question, we need to know what Chernobyl was as well. And I think the, the idea of Chernobyl to a lot of people is one of, of misunderstanding. It's, it's a place of mutant creatures or a sort of cop out location in cheap blockbusters to try and generate a bit of jump scare or cheap tension. Uh, and to, to some of you on the call, it may be nothing more than a map on Call of Duty 4. But I was equally uninformed about that disaster until I watched the HBO Sky series last year, as I know, or I hope many of you probably have too. And if not, I fully recommend it. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and if you have seen it, then you'll have a, a very good idea about the nature of the disaster, the events, the reaction, and I suppose importantly, the real potential horrors of, of radiation and, and nuclear energy, uh, which of course you can get a hint from from this photo, which was taken the, the day of the accident. But I think regardless of whether you've seen the Sky Show or not, I want to introduce you to Chernobyl because, or the disaster, and maybe in doing so prove to you why Gorbachev believed it was such a critical event and therefore why he made the claim that he did uh, in 2006. Now, I tried and I tried to explain the physics behind the explosion on this PowerPoint, but I will be honest, uh, I did struggle. Uh, while looking at nuclear physics and nuclear power is a big interest of mine, uh, I of course know that it's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, and I was struggling to try and explain it in a way that wasn't too long, or a way that wouldn't bore everyone to death, frankly, because that's not what I want. So I have found this excellent video that explains the, the physics behind the nuclear power and indeed the physics behind why Chernobyl exploded far better than I ever could. Uh, and I'm going to screen share it with you and hopefully the video will be clear on everybody's screens. Um, I do apologize, it is a 13 minute long video and I fully appreciate that's a very long time to be watching a video uh, on Zoom but I reckon it's the best way uh, for really setting the sheen of the Chernobyl disaster. And so I will keep quiet throughout. If there are any issues, please do say something in the chat so that maybe I could send you the link and you could watch it on your own device. Uh, but if I could ask everyone to turn their cameras off because that should hopefully make the video run a little bit smoother for everybody. So I'm going to screen share now and hopefully it should work. Right now, underneath a failed Russian nuclear reactor in a lonely basement room, there is two tons of radioactive lava. It's been more than 30 years since it first formed there, and it's still hot. Let's get technical. I've always been personally fascinated with nuclear physics and nuclear power. I guess you could say, I just think it's rad. But if you read up on these topics for any amount of time, you will inevitably hear about Chernobyl, a nuclear power plant in the northern part of Ukraine that experienced the worst nuclear disaster in human history. The story of Chernobyl is downright gripping, but perhaps because of this, it is sometimes difficult to find less sensational and more informative information on the topic. So for today's episode, we're going to go through how Chernobyl actually worked from an engineering perspective, how it melted down from a physics perspective, and the lethality of what it left behind. So grab your gas mask and a Geiger counter. We're going in. First, we need to know how nuclear reactors make energy. The infamous Chernobyl nuclear reactor was a nuclear fission reactor, and nuclear fission is the act of splitting larger, less stable atoms into smaller, more stable ones. And this splitting requires some initial particles like neutrons from the reactor, and what is produced are those smaller atoms, some energy, and then more neutrons. The trick to creating fission power is building your device in such a way that you can guarantee that those neutrons you are creating from this fission reaction will go on to hit other large fuel atoms that you are using, like uranium-235, and that creates a sustained fission reaction. 
Nuclear fission reactors sustain these chain reactions specifically by putting their radioactive fuel, usually in the form of some kind of rod, in a specific orientation and geometry in the core, such that they are close enough together and in the right way that the neutrons that are produced from the fission reactions happening inside of these rods go on to hit enough atoms in the other rods to make this chain reaction happen. The energy that is produced is in the form of heat, and in Chernobyl's case, that heat is then routed into a coolant that is water, and and that water flashes into steam, that steam goes into turbines, which turn and generate electricity. As you might expect, you would not want a chain reaction to get out of control. So nuclear reactors have numerous controls on how quickly a reaction can proceed and have ways to slow it down to produce less heat and less electricity so that nothing goes wrong. In Chernobyl's case, this is what the reactor looked like in terms of producing power. You had fuel rods at the center flinging neutrons at each other and getting really hot, and then you had coolant water around those control rods, which would also absorb neutrons and flash into steam, turn turbines create electricity, but then you also had control rods made out of some neutron absorbing material that could again slow everything down when inserted. The grand promise of nuclear energy is that when all of this is done right, you can get literally millions of times more energy per kilogram than we currently get from any fossil fuel, terajoules per kilogram. And aside from the dangerous nuclear waste, which admittedly we haven't really figured out how to deal with yet, nuclear energy is clean. Of course, this is when everything goes right. When a nuclear reactor goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Chernobyl's infamous reactor was a so-called RBMK reactor, and if you were to look inside of it, you would see something like this. The majority of the core was made out of graphite, like you'd find in your pencil, because it just so happens that graphite is a good neutron moderator. It slows down very fast neutrons, because slow neutrons are just better at sustaining nuclear reactions. That's how the physics works out. Also inside, you had a number of control rods made out of boron carbide, which absorb neutrons, and then again, you had the water Water, which absorbed neutrons and created that critical electricity. And keep in mind, we were just zooming in there to look at the intricacies. If you zoom out, the entire core is huge. It's over 20 feet tall and 40 feet wide. The design of RBMK reactors in particular made energy production in this Russian power plant a delicate balance of heating and cooling and reactivity and absorbing neutrons. And on April 26th, 1986, a lack of that balance led to disaster. Thanks to a deadly combination of human error and design flaws, what happened next at Chernobyl will be felt for centuries. On that April morning in 1986, the staff were running a risky test to see how Chernobyl's Reactor Unit 4 would fare at low power with some of its emergency systems shut off. And also during that test, they reduced the number of control rods they would usually want from 30 to 6. Adding to the danger, RBMK reactors in Russia at the time had what is now considered a serious design flaw, a positive void coefficient. Remember that running throughout the zoomed in version of our reactor here, you have water flowing around the uranium fuel rods acting as both a neutron absorber and a coolant. These reactors are supposed to create steam to generate electricity with all the heat coming off of these fuel rods. However, if steam starts being produced inside of the core next to these fuel rods because of, say, a surge in energy production, it can form voids. Voids in the form of steam where water should be. And steam is not nearly as good as water at absorbing neutrons. So when the neutrons are coming off, they go through these voids and hit the other fuel rods, increasing the reactivity of the reactor, which creates creates more voids, more steam, more heat, more voids. It creates a positive feedback loop that can spin everything out of control. And on 1.23 a.m. on that fateful day, that's exactly what happened. During Reactor Unit 4's low power test, which involved a number of procedural violations, a positive feedback loop of heat and steam started to take shape. Within an hour of starting the test, a domino effect of human error and design flaws led to an increase in reactor power of 12,000%. This intense flood of heat flashed all of the core's coolant water to steam so rapidly it created a steam explosion that dislodged the top shield of the reactor. It weighed 2 million pounds. 
After another explosion, the rush of air coming into the failed reactor set the graphite on fire, which is almost impossible to extinguish. Fire and explosion led to an eventual release of eight tons of radioactive material into the atmosphere. This was Chernobyl's main release of radiation into the surrounding areas. With no check on the uranium fuel's temperature, what happened next was meltdown. Inside of the ruined reactor, the fuel rods had no checks and balances on their temperature, so the uranium got hot enough to literally melt down. And then they got to about half the temperature of the surface of the sun and started to glow incandescently with light. At the same time, firefighters outside in helicopters were trying to douse the graphite fires with five million kilograms of sand, clay, and other materials. Many of the helicopter pilots died shortly thereafter from fatal doses of radiation carried by these fires because it took nine days to put these fires out. The fires were extinguished, but something was still burning at the bottom of reactor unit four, radioactive lava. The core of unit four was destroyed, but it wasn't all gone. Some of it was eating its way into the earth. If you wanted to know what the most dangerous material humans ever created was, corium would be a good answer. After the fuel rods in Reactor 4 melted down, they flowed like lava to the bottom shield of the reactor. Eight days later, they had eaten all the way through it, and then they ate through two meters worth of concrete flowing into the basement sections of Chernobyl through basement pipes and steam corridors. Thousands of kilograms of uranium oxide, sand, silica glass, molten metal was all flowing as streams of the composite monstrosity known as corium. And underneath Unit 4, it was forming unnatural and terrifying stalactites and stalagmites. But the most famous of these formations was so uniquely dangerous that you may have already heard about it. Eight months after the explosion that created a dead zone around Chernobyl, nuclear inspectors were in the basement of Unit 4 looking for the remains of the core material and the fuel rods. They turned a corner and they saw this. It was a two-ton mass of corium still eating its way into the earth. It had taken on a grayish, wrinkled appearance, and so they dubbed it the elephant's foot. This photo in particular was taken in 1990, just four years after the incident, and it was given to a Dr. Zoller at the University of Washington. And I just wanted to read you the caption on this image. Quote, this is a slide I attained from the Russians. It shows what is called the elephant's foot. The Russians obtained this picture by sending a man down there with a camera. He took one picture and then he came back up. I was told that he died from the radiation he received. So this picture cost a man his life. You're looking at possibly the most dangerous room in the world. When the elephant's foot was first found, after sitting in a basement for eight months, it was still extremely radioactive. If you were back in 1986 and you found yourself standing next to it, as close as I am to it right now, you would be guaranteed a lethal dose of radiation. You would die, even with treatment, after just 200 seconds. And over 30 years later, the elephant's foot is still very dangerous. As the years have gone by, the elephant's foot has changed rather substantially. It has cracked and cooled, and it has become, yes, less radioactive. But in 2001, those radioactivity levels were measured such that you still would not be able to spend more than about 60 minutes in its presence, or else you would get a fatal dose of radiation. And if you extrapolated that radioactivity to today, it's still radioactive enough such that you wouldn't be able to spend more than a few hours in its presence without receiving a fatal dose. And today, the radioactive lava that is the elephant's foot, it's still eating into the earth below Chernobyl, and it is still hot. It's not as hot as it once was, like half the temperature of the surface of the sun, but it's still hotter than the surrounding air temperature, thanks to the pulsing and burning radioactivity inside of it. The radiation released around Chernobyl, though, is more immediately dangerous to humans. The explosion threw out enough fallout such that the surrounding areas will remain unlivable for humans in the long term for around three to six centuries, if we're lucky. The vegetation and the wildlife around Chernobyl, though, is doing surprisingly well, so maybe with a bit of luck, humans will one day return. However, when dealing with forces such as these, luck isn't always on our side. That's, that's a picture of a real elephant with its feet. That's, don't try to be funny. This is a serious, serious episode. 
There is so much more to this story. The politics, the people that decided to live in the exclusion zone, what happened to the wildlife and is happening, how the entire place has become a tourist attraction for Instagram influencers. It's all sobering and fascinating, and I recommend that you read into it more if you're interested at all. Chernobyl and the steel sarcophagus that now contains it will still be there, and if it's never cracked and cleaned up, so too will the elephant's foot. It will just sit there for centuries alone in a dark basement, a dangerous symbol and reminder of terrifying and amazing potential. Because science. Obviously, it's hard to visualize what actually happened in the core of Chernobyl, and thankfully, we have scientists that look into these kinds of things. So here at Argonne National Laboratories, they have scientists that are actually working with corium. So this is what uranium lava actually looks like. Yeah. Scary. And this is what it looks like. Here's a simulation of it eating through concrete. I think it can eat through uh, a few feet per day or something like that. So it is, it is crazy hot and scary, and we have people studying it. And you think corium is scary when it's cooled down. Hmm, check, it, check it when it's hot. Uh, so, uh, welcome back. I hope that everyone is still here, and that wasn't too boring. I know it was a long video, but now... Uh, we're in a fantastic position to really dive into some of the analysis of Chernobyl. Uh, and I hope that everyone found it a little bit interesting or even maybe a little bit terrifying. Uh, either way, both is good. Um, so the explosion at Chernobyl, uh, as, I, as was mentioned in the video, was caused by a failed safety test on the 26th of April, 1986. Uh, and this resulted in a massive release of radioactive isotopes of uranium, and cesium, plutonium, iodine, uh, and so on. About eight tons of it. Uh, and you can see here how the radioactive fallout was spread all across Europe. You know, this wasn't just a Soviet problem, this was really a global issue. And that little gif in the corner shows how radiation was blown about by winds across the entire continent. Now, to give you a sense of scale, when Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima at the end of World War II, only 1.38% of the uranium in that bomb actually fissioned. The rest was, was vaporized and blown away before it had a chance to. So that means that the fission of just 0.7 grams of uranium, that's less than the weight of a banknote, was enough to kill 80,000 people instantly. In Chernobyl, reactor number four on the night of the explosion, there were over 2 million grams of uranium. Now, we mustn't confuse a nuclear bomb with a nuclear meltdown. They're, they're not the same thing. And there were no mushroom clouds at Chernobyl. But uh, I think that shows the, the potential and the size of devastation. And as you can see on this map, was was far greater in Chernobyl than the atomic bomb ever was. Um, now, the total amount of radiation released uh, from the point of explosion until the big steel sarcophagus was built just two months later over the reactor was about 50 million curies. But, but what does that number mean? How much really is 50 million curies? You know, that number meant very little to me when I first came across it, and I imagine that it means very little to most of you too as well. Well, let me put that into perspective, because I think uh, it's really important to understand the sheer scale of this disaster in order to understand where, where Gorbachev was coming from. So, as you may know, or may or not know, uh, scientists are trying to make the concept of radiation uh, more understandable and accessible to the general public, for you and me. And the chief method that they've come up with is explaining radiation exposure in terms of banana equivalents. Uh, bananas, of course, are famous for containing potassium specifically potassium-35 for strong bones, but they also contain potassium-40, which is a naturally occurring radioactive isotope of potassium, which means that bananas are quite famously radioactive. Uh, so in the spirit of these scientists, I thought I would show you what 50 million curies looks like in bananas. Uh, now one banana, as you can see on screen, puts out roughly 0.1 microsieverts of radiation, which is almost nothing. It's, it's completely harmless and it's barely distinguishable from the, from the background radiation. But 50 million curies worth of bananas, uh, 
Well, that's that many bananas, 6 trillion, 480 billion bananas. Now, that is enough bananas to wrap around the Earth's equator. Sorry, let me move my... Okay, that is enough bananas to wrap around the Earth's equator. Impressed? Well, in fact, I'm not quite finished. In fact, that is enough bananas to wrap around the Earth's equator, not once, not twice, but 29,000 times. Or, if you prefer, that is enough bananas to travel from the Earth to the Sun and back four times. It is just a staggeringly big number. Uh, but these, these numbers, they're still, they're just too big for humans to really be able to, to compute. So they're just arbitrary numbers at this point. So I want to put Chernobyl's scale across in a more human perspective for everybody before we move on. Now, I'll keep moving my thing. Uh, this is a real picture of the Chernobyl liquidators or the bio robots as the Soviet Union called them at the time. Uh, and again, if you've seen the Sky Show, you will definitely know the circumstances of this picture. But if not, these men were given just 90 seconds to run onto the roof of the reactor, shovel as much debris, which was highly, highly radioactive, as discussed, um, and shovel it up and throw it into the exposed reactor core and run off the roof. 90 seconds to do that. Now that's not 90 seconds a day, nor 90 seconds a week, or even 90 seconds a month. That is 90 seconds total in their life. Uh, and that is because in that 90 seconds, uh, that's not too much longer you know, than the time that I've been talking to you today. These men were exposed to seven and a half lifetimes worth of radiation exposure, about 600 years in 90 seconds. Um, and in fact, the I'll move my thing again so you can see it. The white and dark stripes at the bottom of this picture were actually caused by the radiation infiltrating the camera lens and damaging the circuitry inside the camera. Um, now, sadly, it is no surprise, therefore, when I tell you that many of these young men did not live to see the collapse of the Soviet Union just five years after this picture was taken. Now, I, I had originally planned to show you now a 90 second clip from the Sky series um, where they depicted a man going onto the roof and, and cleaning. But however, unfortunately, very last minute yesterday, Sky decided to copyright all of their footage and I'm no longer allowed to show it to you. But I have actually found some real life footage of the same event that I dug for for a very long time. Uh, and I want to share it with you instead. It's, it's a little bit less dramatic, I'll, I'll say that, but in a way I think it's much more interesting because it is in fact the real thing, it's real footage from the men cleaning the roof and I just thought I'd show it to you for perspective. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. 
so there we are that was 90 seconds on the roof clean as much as possible and and get off like i said um i apologize my the sky one was much more dramatic than that but they they copyrighted it last minute so uh moving finally to sort of expand on that idea of those men not actually being living at the time of the collapse i just want to return to that number one more time before i move on that 50 million curies now one millicurie or one one thousandth of a curie is considered a, a sort of watershed dosage by doctors, meaning that if you're exposed to more than one millicurie at any one time, then death is inevitable. You are essentially a dead man uh, walking at that point. So unlike some of the previous stats, this actually allows for quite a, an easy calculation. So one millicurie is enough to kill a human. 50 million curies were released. So that means that 50 billion lethal doses of radiation were released by that reactor in two months. So 50 billion, that is enough, those of you who do geography will know, that is enough to kill the world population as of today seven times over. Or, and I personally think this is the most astonishing fact that I came across in this entire project, that is enough radiation to have killed one in every two humans to have ever existed on planet Earth. Half of our entire species, had they all existed at once, could have been killed by that amount of radiation. Uh, now, I want to let that digest for a moment, or I wanted to let that digest for a moment, but I should explain that I, I haven't just picked a really low quality photo from the internet here. This photo was taken the day after the explosion from a helicopter uh, and the photographer was told at the time just to take a few steps back from the window to be safe from the radiation which of course we now know is laughable uh, but that's why you can see the circular shape of the window uh, and all the little green dots and all the grains that you can see is actually corruption of the film where it had been hit by radioactive particles uh, and this is why I love this picture so much because it actually allows us to to visualize the radiation that was pumping out of this reactor 24 seven. So with all that, now you know what we're up against when trying to evaluate Chernobyl's importance. So, you know, what other factors did I consider? What could possibly rival Chernobyl given what I've just told you? It's a good question. Well, there are, there are a number of factors that we do actually need to consider because Chernobyl, of course, didn't take place in a vacuum. There were, there were many other things going on at this time simultaneously. And the most important of which I think was the war in Afghanistan, uh, which is commonly known as the sort of the Soviet Union's very own Vietnam. It, this was an attempt by the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan and then try and install a communist government whilst trying to make it look like a sort of big, spontaneous, glorious revolution, when in fact they discovered it was a much, much bigger challenge than they thought, and they ended up spending, spending billions of dollars in, in a decade fighting uh, guerrilla warfare with resistance groups most famously called the Mujahideen. Now this war in fact is where bin Laden learned his trade as a uh, freedom fighter and a terrorist which of course gives this war significance in itself but why is it important in the collapse? Well Afghanistan had gained a bit of a nickname through the years as the graveyard of empires and for good reason as well. The British, we tried and failed twice in the 18th century to invade Afghanistan. Tsarist Russia, so Russia before it was communist, tried shortly after we did to invade Afghanistan, failed. And of course, you now know that Russia tried again in the 1970s and failed. So it doesn't seem, it seems quite reasonable to propose that maybe this was the graveyard of the USSR too, perhaps. Secondly, uh, we also do need to consider this, the anti-alcohol campaign, which is a factor that I actually found quite funny, and you'll find out why uh, in a moment. But this was a an attempt by Gorbachev to try and resolve what he called the mortality crisis, uh, which was a serious problem at the time, and it still is a very large problem in Russian society today. Uh, essentially, the, the life expectancy of Russian citizens was about 10 years shy of those in the West, which of course is not great for the propaganda machine. So Gorbachev pinned this down to the level of alcohol consumption in Russian society. Uh, and he blamed drunkenness, not just for this low life expectancy, but also for the stagnating economy itself. Um, and so he essentially introduced prohibition into the USSR, thus earning him the very fitting name, 
the Mineralni Secretar, or the Mineral Water Secretary. Uh, now this at first may sound a little bit irrelevant, um, and at first compared to the idea of this mass nuclear fallout, I understand why you may think that, but the economic effects of this were catastrophic because just how dependent the Soviet Union was on vodka. So dependent, in fact, that the government in 1985 received more money from taxing people's vodka than they did from taxing people's wages, which in itself is just astonishing. They, they earned about $25 billion a year from taxing vodka sales alone. And uh, Gorbachev even mentioned in his memoirs, which I had to read through for this project, uh, that his chief of cabinet, Nikolai Ryshkov, who, you know, is this big, grey-faced, intimidating Soviet man, was actually reduced to tears in a meeting once over how much money that his that the economy was losing because of this alcohol ban. So I thought it was definitely uh, significant. And the image you can see here is actually a poster used during this anti-alcohol campaign, and it reads, things you could have bought your children instead of that bottle of vodka. Uh, now, we also definitely need to think about Gorbachev's foreign policy, because this is arguably what he was most famous for. Uh, and undoubtedly, Gorbachev's biggest failure in this sort of area was his attempt to renegotiate the treat the constitution sorry, of the Soviet Union in 1990 uh, in order to try and appease loads of the nations that I mentioned earlier that were sort of on the edge of gaining independence from the USSR by this point. And this new constitution was called the New Union Treaty. So he arranged to meet with representatives from all 15 of these countries and he planned multiple changes to the Soviet constitution. He, he actually removed the word socialism from the constitution altogether, which is quite a significant change. Um, but uh, as big as it sounded and as significant as it maybe was, how did it fare? Well, six out of the 15 countries in the USSR boycotted the treaty altogether. They didn't even recognize it and they ignored it. And the remaining nine all held referendums on whether to accept the new treaty or to go independent. And they held these referendums in 1990, 1991. Uh, and to show you how this new treaty was accepted, by the Russian people, or the, sorry, the Soviet people, Ukraine, which was by far the most important country in the Soviet Union behind Russia itself, uh, recorded a record 86% turnout in that referendum. And that's 20% higher than the turnout in our Brexit referendum just a few years ago. Uh, and it voted 90% in favor of independence, which is about as a decisive result possible in a referendum of that, that size. So very, very anti Gorbachev at this point. Uh, and this is interesting because it's the most obvious example of Gorbachev failing, outright failing. And so perhaps this seems to be the very sort of thing that he was trying to blame Chernobyl for. And, and finally, so we need to look at these two absolutely fundamental reforms of the Gorbachev era. They're very, very famous, and you may have even heard of them. Uh, they were defining policies that um, if you were to ask a GCC or even an A-level student who studied this period, why they thought the Soviet Union collapsed, I guarantee 99%, maybe even 100% would say these two reforms. Um, so put very simply, perestroika, which means openness, was the economic side of reform. And it essentially led to this little injection of capitalism into communist society. It sort of allowed private ownership of businesses and businesses could set their own quotas and sell off excess for profit, which is a very sort of capitalist Western principles that uh, would have been unthinkable in the USSR just a few years earlier. Whereas glasdost, which means transparency, was the political side of the reforms, and that was equally sort of liberating. They uh, allowed uh, political parties to exist, it released censorship of the press and uh, censorship of information. So I hope even those who may not know too much about Soviet history, I hope you can just gauge roughly how revolutionary these, these signature reforms were and hence why those 99% of GCSE students think the way that they do. Uh, and everything that I've talked about in this presentation has all been on the sort of context of these massive social and economic reforms. And this is where the line begins to blur as to uh, when trying to cross evaluate the importance of all of these things going on simultaneously. Now, the arms race is, is the final factor that I'll talk to you about today. And it's a big glaring omission from what I've talked about. This is a very 
very famous uh, competition of arms between the USA and the Soviet Union um, that lasted from the end of World War II all the way up until the collapse in 1991. Um, and I admit that it was by far the most expensive thing that the Soviet Union ever spent its money on. But uh, I chose not to really think about the arms race when, when looking into how significant all these factors were because not only did I find very esteemed historians like a man called Vladimir Kontolovich um, arguing that the arms race had little role in the collapse, but I also interviewed an indirect Chernobyl victim called Julie Bond uh, during my research. And she was an Irish exchange student in Ukraine at the time um, of the accident. And she's since suffered from several telltale radiation health issues. She, she developed thyroid cancer with no family history and her children have since been born one deaf and one with Down syndrome, uh, with no family history whatsoever. So, and her doctors largely attribute that to the four days that she spent um, near Chernobyl after it exploded. Um, and she also told me, as you can see there on the quote on screen, that she thought that it was not so much these big arms race projects, but just the little things like Chernobyl, like the alcohol campaign that eventually led to collapse. So. So how could it not be true? That's maybe the question you're thinking of right now. And, and this is, we've sort of come full circle and we need to arrive at a conclusion. Well, given everything that I've told you today, you may feel exactly like I did when I was bringing all my research together. How could it not be true? How could Chernobyl not be the true cause? Um, Gorbachev must have been correct. Six and a half trillion bananas, for God's sake, is ridiculous. But, you know, from an economic point of view, when I tell you that Chernobyl cost around $235 billion. That's five times the cost of Afghanistan and 10 times the cost of the Afghan of the alcohol campaign, sorry. So, and it wiped out an area of farmland the size of England and Wales combined. It was enormously catastrophic. And from a political point of view, when I tell you that Chernobyl was the inspiration behind the founding of the very political party that went on to win that Ukrainian independence referendum I mentioned earlier, it's it's called it's very difficult to look past Chernobyl, um, and especially when you've got people in their thousands, as you can see on screen, marching down the capitals of their nations, and as the sign in the top left corner reads, demanding a Nuremberg trial for Chernobyl. How could this event not be considered as a as a definitive moment in collapse? It all looks very promising. Um, well. There's been another biblical prophecy fulfilling itself uh, through both this presentation and through all my year long projects of researching this. Uh, and that was it's a very famous quote from the Bible. I'm sure you've all heard of it before. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. What do I mean by that? Let me move my confirmation bias. Seek and you shall find. I went into this project wanting this to be true so badly. I wanted Chernobyl to be the true cause just because of how amazing that would be what a romantic sort of amazing conclusion um, but as i now know this is not quite the case you see i may have told you some little white lies in this presentation now don't get me wrong everything that i've told you is is true and painstakingly researched of course but let me give you an example that 235 billion dollars that i mentioned earlier the cost of chernobyl um, whilst that was the estimated total cost, that was not the cost that the Soviet Union actually paid. You see, radiation, it takes years to take full effect on the body uh, in the form of cancers, like, like we saw with Julie. She didn't develop any sort of signs of being affected by radiation for 20 years or so. So the vast majority of that $235 billion has been spent on healthcare and compensation since, and therefore most of it was spent after 1991 after the collapse, uh, which of course is outside the realm of what we're talking about today. And you know, uh, you know it, can be, uh, it can't be the cause of the collapse when the collapse has already happened. Um, a perfect example, in 2019, Belarus, which was probably the worst affected by the fallout, spent 8% of its GDP on Chernobyl compensation alone, 8%. So in fact, Gorbachev himself said in his memoirs, that the initial cost of the disaster was, was only $30 billion, which don't get me wrong, that's no lunch money, but the real cost of Chernobyl in the period that we're looking at, it, 30 billion puts it on par with Afghanistan and on par with the 
anti-alcohol campaign. So it doesn't actually stick out like a sore thumb, like it seemed earlier. And with regard to the politics, yes, many political groups were formed after the accident. The very first legal pressure groups in the USSR were ones protesting for the end of nuclear power, obviously inspired by what happened at Chernobyl. But again, this is misleading because opposition groups existed in their hundreds before the disaster. Um, and they were just more secretive and underground and harder to really know about. Uh, and in fact, as the final nail in the coffin point of this presentation, without those perestroika and glasnost reforms that I glossed over earlier, the relaxation of censorship and everything it involved, this information would likely still be state, everything I've talked about in this presentation, all the info on Chernobyl and all the other factors would likely still be state secret hidden on a shelf somewhere in a Russian archive. We wouldn't know about any of this without those two reforms. So what have we learned to, to sort of wrap things up? Uh, it brings more nicely to what, what we've sort of learned from this uh, presentation. Firstly, I hope uh, we've all learned at least a little bit about why the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and some of the biggest contributions um, to this century defining event. Um, secondly, we, we've learned some truth about Chernobyl disaster, the whys and the whats and the hows, like I said at the start, uh, of the worst nuclear disaster in history by a country mile. But importantly, we've tried to look past the sensationalism and the, the glorification of this disaster. Uh, and we put it into the context of the time, which is so, so important when looking at things like this. And lastly, uh, where I'll leave off today, uh, we have most likely seen history repeating itself here. Uh, and in that Gorbachev and Donald Trump of all people seem to be guilty of the same crime here. I believe personally, and you may disagree, but I think that Gorbachev may have blamed the Chernobyl disaster for the collapse of the Soviet Union in the same way that Donald Trump blamed coronavirus to explain his defeat in last year's election. Why? Because at the heart of it, both men are politicians uh, and blaming the thing that they were blameless for. And I will leave you with that. Um, thank you for listening. I, I appreciate it's been quite a long presentation and I've been talking for a lot of it. Um, you're now quickly you're looking at a picture of Chernobyl what it looks like today 35 years on with a, a new confinement building built over it that will last the next 100 years it was finished in 2016 whilst we try and think of a way of, of cleaning it up because we're still we haven't really got any ideas of how we're going to clean up what's inside that building but uh, again thank you for your attention and I am now if you can bear to stay any longer, if you want to go, that's fine. But I'm open to any questions that anyone might have regarding Chernobyl, about the science, the politics, or anything else that I've talked about. So that's that's me done. Does anybody have any questions? For well, there is one question in the chat, I think. Ben had a question Ooh. earlier on. Yeah. Uh, why couldn't they just left it alone? Oh, the roof. Uh, I'm assuming you mean why couldn't they, why did they have to clean it up and yeah. send the men out? Well, Essentially, they needed to, that picture I showed you at the end with the big arch, they needed to cover this thing up somehow because it's, it's spewing off all this radiation into the air and it's, it's causing an enormous problem. So they needed to cover it up somehow. And without taking all the debris off of the roof, they couldn't get the workmen and the helicopters and the cranes over the reactor, over the top, the bit that was exposed. They couldn't do it because the men that were sitting in the cranes and in the helicopters would just well, die a few days later if they didn't get all the radioactive debris off of the reactor before constructing it over it. So that's why they had to resort to using men. They had originally planned on using robots. Uh, and again, you'll know that if you've seen the Sky series, they make quite a strong reference to that, but no robotic technology on earth um, in the 1980s was strong enough to withstand that level of radiation. So they had to resort to using men, so. Oh, good, good question. Has anyone else got any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Anton. Oh, Tom, Anton is from the Ukraine. Okay, so you've got. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking from a political point of view. So, um, Chernobyl, like Gorbachev said, that it was like the reason why it collapsed. But it's, I don't know if it's true or not. But I understand that uh, it wasn't only from the inside of USSR that both like people were arguing about it there were protests everything from outside from european union from usa as well from all other countries they had to be like against it they had to be like because gorbachev they they 
hide in it they've hidden it right like first few weeks months no one knew about it and when they found out um european union they were like really mad about it but i mean would this affect the collapse in any way because i mean it's still like a strong like effect i mean would do you think would the soviet union have collapsed without chernobyl do you mean or uh no no i mean um because from what I've seen in your presentation is that it, the like, what you've discussed is that it might be a reason why it collapsed, because it changed USSR from the inside, and what I'm asking, did it change uh, other countries' opinion? Did the, did they like push on USSR from outside to like, and it led to collapse? Uh, that's a yeah, that's an interesting. Th there was definitely. Uh, international protest against the idea of using nuclear power. I think well, the biggest reaction to in America, for example, where they they have had nuclear disasters themselves, of course, not to this scale, but I think there was a lot of people that not so much targeted against the Soviet Union, but there was a lot of protest against nuclear energy and people saying, well, how on earth can we keep using nuclear power when it's just destroyed you know, so much of the Ukraine? But in terms of international pressure, Gorbachev, you're right, he did keep a lot of it secret. And there's actually, in some um, people's sort of memoirs of the events, there are stories where um, Russian sort of KGB officials would sneak into the schools at night and take the Geiger counters out of the school laboratories because they didn't want the schools detecting the radiation. They were, they were covering it up and hiding it. So they were actually sneaking into schools and taking the... We have them at Seaford, the little Geiger counters that you can do physics experiments with they stole them um so there was a lot of cover-up and definitely i know margaret thatcher was very very harsh on, on gorbachev for the secrecy because the international community knew about it before the russians did or before the soviet people anyway did uh, and it's something i left out of my presentation for time reasons but the first people to sort of bring attention to the fact that chernobyl had exploded wasn't the russians it was the it was the swedish um, who they had some plant workers going into work one morning and they, for, for obvious reasons on nuclear reactors, they have um, radiation detectors on the exits and they were setting them off. And so they originally thought that the Swedish, the Swedish workers had thought that their plant was leaking, found no leak and they deduced that it must have been coming from outside the plant and they traced it back to Soviet, the Soviet Union. So there was a lot of secrecy and a lot of international outrage definitely at that. And I've I mean, the, I'm not sure if there were any tariffs or things like that on the Soviet Union, but it wouldn't surprise me. And that would have definitely contributed as well. Yeah, so you don't think that uh, outside pressure could in any way lead to the collapse of USSR, like in this case? I think it was definitely more of an internal reason why they collapsed, because Gorbachev, by the 1980s, he was opening up to the West quite significantly. Um, you know, with the nuclear, the sort of ending the arms race with the West was a big one, whereas the sort of internal hatred of the USSR from all the countries within it. Um, I suppose you could use Scotland and the UK as a little bit of an anecdote. Um, the internal tension between them was, I think, much more important. Like you saw in that Ukraine referendum, 90% voting for independence is pretty definitive. Yeah. Awesome. But for the point of good question, Anton, for the point of time, um, what we'll do is, is thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Tom, for presenting. And if you want to ask Tom a question, feel free to stay behind. But if not, have a lovely evening. And well done, Tom. I thought that was genuinely an excellent presentation. It was truly outstanding. That was incredible. So would you guys mind unmuting yourself and just giving him a, a massive round of applause? Because to do that in front of his peers is really difficult.